Hi, this is the orientation for all of our classes here at Gone to the Dogs. I am Laura Bussing, I'm our head trainer, and you will also be working under Sarah Highfield, one of our other trainers, and we welcome you to our training classes here at Gone to the Dogs. I am a certified professional dog trainer. I've been training dogs for more than 30 years. I'm also a certi certified canine fitness trainer as well. I need you to make a list of some of the things you need to bring with you to class. One thing is I would like your dog to come on a regular normal type collar and or a harness on a six foot leash. And I'll put that right here on Rain. What I don't want you to bring is a dog on a prong, an e-collar, shock collar, or, um, or a choke collar. I also need you to bring treats with you. I need you to bring medium value treats, which would be like a bag of dog treats. And then I also need you to bring really high value things with you. Um, and this is, um, this is freeze dried rabbit. These pucks, we can break them up into small pieces. But to me, high value is anything out of your fridge that you would eat, like uh, chopped up chicken or steak or pork, hot dogs, something that's really, really high in the value system for dogs. I also need you to bring something to put your treats in, and that would be a treat pouch uh, like this, something that goes around your waist and that you can put the treats in and that, then that you can deliver them to your dog pretty efficiently. Also, um, something that you can bring as well, optional is a clicker. If you're gonna use a clicker, bring your clicker. We would like for you to park at the back of our building and before you come into our facility, if you would take your dog potty out back. And of course, if your dog happens to um, go to the bathroom outside, please pick that up for us. Class structure. Our classes last for about 45 minutes and we do take a break in the middle of class so that the dogs can um, just get mentally uh, decharged from what's been going on in class. We also would like for you uh, to turn your cell phones off and it's really important for you to be an active listener when myself or Sarah, when we are explaining um, some facet of the mechanics of training your dog. If you're here for our levels obedience classes, you will be starting in level one. And as for times and dates for classes, please see our website or refer to your student handbook for those class dates and times. So I want to give you an overview of our training philosophy, the basic needs of all dogs, how they think, how they learn as well. And a lot of the, and some of the core training concepts that we'll be using here in class. At the very end of this video, there's going to be a little short pre-assignment that I would want you to do before you attend class. And it really is kind of mandatory that you do this pre-assignment before you come so that when you show up to class for the first time, you know what's going on, you know a lot about learning theory and how dogs learn, and you walk in the class and bang, we start training your dog right from the get-go. Our training philosophy. Let's talk about what our mythology is of how we train dogs. What I wanna do is to create a relationship built on trust between you and your dog. We do that by using positive reinforcement, and I use something known as choice-based reward training. So how that works is we basically want the dogs to think for themselves and problem solve. We won't be doing any pushing or punishing or physical manipulation of our dogs. We simply are gonna give our dogs the opportunity to make the right choice. And when they do, they get a reward for it, a food treat. When they get it wrong, they simply will get nothing. And it's really a great way for dogs to learn because they learn as much from getting it wrong as they do from getting it right. And they really learn what doesn't work and they learn what does work. And what we turn our dogs into is a willing, eager participant in the dog training process. But really, let's not really think of it so much as dog training. I like for you to just to think that you're playing with your dog. And I certainly want your dog to feel that you're just playing with them because the more we make it fun for them, the more they're going to be that willing, eager participant. I also like to have dogs get the, a really good work ethic with the philosophy of there's nothing for free. 
and our dogs are going to work for a reward. They're going to do something for us. And I also want to implement a lot of real life rewards as we get going with the training down the line a little bit. At first, when we're teaching a dog a new behavior or we're trying to really make it very clear to them, we are going to use a food reward first and then we'll start phasing these out and I'll have you do something known as a real life reward. So we'll start using real life rewards for our dogs and we won't be so much on treats as we continue their learning program here at Gone to the Dogs. Basic needs of dogs. Our dogs every day have a need for physical and mental stimulation. And I try to think of it as every day that we need to think about satisfying the dog and the dog, if you will. That's going to be age appropriate exercise and some mental stimulation as well. We want to make sure our dogs are not bored, but they're, they're satisfied in our absence when we have to go off to work. And let's think about really what, what are our dogs. They are natural scavengers and hunters. Our modern companion dogs evolved from village dogs. Village dogs evolved from the wolf. So there's a misconception that our modern dogs, like Reindeer King, was evolved right directly from a wolf, and that's not so. She evolved directly from village dogs. So if we think about the village dog that we see everywhere in the third world today, if you go to anywhere like Indonesia, Africa, South America, you're going to find a 30 pound brown in color um, small dog and they look the same everywhere in the world. That's what our modern dogs have evolved from. And these village dogs, they spend their entire day working for food. And that kind of gets me back to what I mentioned earlier in our philosophy of training about nothing for free. So our modern dogs, they also have a work ethic that's hardwired into them as well. And it's something we need to tap in them as we're training them and as we're thinking about providing for their basic needs every day. For example, we want to make sure uh, they've had plenty of exercise before we go to work so that we avoid any destructive behavior out of a bored dog left alone. We also want to leave some mental stimulation out for them, um, like puzzles and uh, chews, uh, food dispensing toys and things like that. Let me show you. I thought I had these things close. So food dispensing toy, this is a wobbler, um, it'll dispense um, uh, kibble out of it. This is a toy with called a monster mouth. You can put uh, treats in there. And then I was also talking about long lasting chews. But what I want you to do is every day, I want you to think about how to provide for your dog's needs every day when you wake up in the morning go and think about, okay, what do I need to do so that my dog is not bored while I'm gone from, for work and that we don't have any destructive behaviors while I'm gone. And so think about the exercise component and then the mental stimulation component as well. Full training, and I want you to think about how they do not speak the English language and how our dogs are communicators of only body language for the most part. They might have some vocalizations, but we want to use our physical cues to show them how to play our training games. And in general, we will be using a lot of physical cues, but we will also use some verbal cues as well, and they will use, they will learn some of the English language from us, but important to know that these dogs speak body language to one another, and they actually tell us a lot with their body language. In general, how dogs think is their outlook on life is, what's in it for me? They're all about instant gratification. Rain is wondering what is in it for her for sitting next to me while I make this video, and if she hangs out here and is, and is being good, I am going to keep rewarding it for her. My other dogs are at my feet, and every now and then you might see me toss them a reward. But I'm rewarding them for paying attention to me. So, in general, what's in it for them? And they want instant gratification. Our dogs are evaluating everything that comes their way. Is it safe or dangerous? If it's safe, they want to know, well, what do I get? And if it's dangerous, they're like, oh, it's going to hurt me and we're likely going to see a fear response. Those fear responses are fight, flight, or freeze. 
and that's what gets us into seeing dogs biting, growling, snapping, and those things when they are when they have perceived that there is a threat coming their direction. What humans need to really understand about our dogs is that they are interested in pleasing themselves. They are not interested in pleasing us. She's wanting to figure out how she can get what's in my hands. So it's not about pleasing me, but she might offer up some behavior, like maybe sitting up pretty, there you go. So I'll let her earn something while she's sitting here. So our animals, unfortunately we tend to humanize them. We're able to put a lot of human traits on them. And in some respects, it's not quite true. I want you to think about um, abstract thought. Humans are really great at abstract thought. Our dogs do not have the capacity for abstract thought. They do not, um, they're not spiteful. They're not, they don't think about getting revenge on us. So, you know, if you go away and you come home and there's a, um, a piddle of dog pee on the floor, it's not that they're trying to get back at you for leaving them at home. It's simply the dog had to pee. They are not spiteful. They're pretty much just this joyous little creature that we are just, gosh, we're just so lucky to have them in our lives. And they are like little kids their whole lives. And that will be as much as I will go to humanizing Rain, is that she's very similar to like a two-year-old. And that's how they are most of their lives. So that's why when we engage with them, we want to play fun games with them. And dogs really are thinking, she's, in, she's wondering again, what's in it for me and how can I get this? So if I wait a second, she'll sit pretty. How dogs learn. I want you to learn the concepts before class about how dogs learn. When you understand more about how your dogs think, how they communicate, and how they learn, the training then becomes so much easier and quicker. So our dog, I now have Jerry with me, my oldest, one of my older dogs. Um, so dogs learn in two ways. They learn by association or consequences. So associative learning is simply, it's emotional learning. It's a feeling that's associated with something. For example, all of our dogs, and I'm sure you've seen this with your dogs, the sound of crinkling paper, crinkling bags, the dog starts, they associate that that is something good because what comes out of the sound of this bag usually are treats or food. And so the dog associates that with a good feeling as, oh, yummy food, that's good. Also, there's the flip side of associative learning with emotions. So for example, think of when you're gonna go give your dog a bath and you're getting all your supplies together and all of a sudden the dog has disappeared. Well, what you don't realize is a dog has formed an association to when you're getting those supplies together in the context of the bathroom, that they perceive that as bad. They know that a bath's coming and so they tend to go and disappear on us. Think about in humans, how we have associations for example, when we all go to the dentist, none of us like to go to the dentist because we think about that drill that they put in our mouths and we pretty much associate it with bad. So a lot of us have anxiety and you know we're not happy to go to the dentist. On the flip side of that, think about how we feel when we walk by the ice cream store and we go in to get ice cream. We feel pretty good. So we have good associations with ice cream. And you have probably seen your dog form a lot of associations in your house and you don't even realize it. Uh, one is with the leash. It's when you go to get the leash out from wherever you might have it hanging up on the wall. When you go to get the leash out, most dogs get very excited when you get the leash out. So that is another form of associative learning. They know that the leash equals you're taking them for a walk, you're taking them somewhere, and the dogs think that's wonderful. So associative learning is scientifically known as classical conditioning. And if you'd like to learn more about classical conditioning, I, I um, highly recommend you Google it. And you're gonna find a lot from Dr. Ivan Pavlov. He's the first doctor, first scientist who worked with classical conditioning and proved a lot of the theories. You've all probably heard of Pavlovian theory where um, 
Dr. Pavlov did experiments with dogs in that basically um, a bell rang and the dogs were then fed. Food went into a bowl for them. So what Dr. Pavlov found out was that the dogs started salivating the moment the just after the bell was rung, after only doing this for a short amount of time. So the bell for the dog was something good and it predicted food for them. And this is actually something we're gonna use in class and you're gonna be amazed about, as you start to think about, what all is my dog classically conditioned to? So I, um, just to put a bee in your bonnet, as you go through the day today, uh, see how your dog reacts to some of the things that you do as a routine and then you will see how your dog has been classically conditioned without you ever really trying for it. So the other way that dogs learn is by consequences and that is simply they learn by doing. So if you ask the dog to sit and if they sit they can earn a treat. This is known as positive reinforcement. The dog made a choice and he gets a reward for it. In dogs consequences have to happen immediately. For example um, very different than in humans. In humans, we're told as kids, if you eat all your vegetables and clean your plate, you get to have dessert tonight. Or something like, if you make all A's this semester, I'm gonna buy you a Porsche when you graduate in May. So those are delayed gratification consequences. For the dog though, they live in the moment, so they need to have instantaneous gratification. Their brain has less than one second I kid you not, less than one second to link reward with behavior. So if I ask Jerry to sit up for me, Jerry, come sit. Good girl. The moment that she sits, she needs to have instant gratification for that. Good girl. Oh, yeah, and she wants to offer up a paw. She really likes to shake. So she got an opportunity to earn reward. Okay, good girl. All done. Come down. So, the brain has less than one second to link reward. So the thing that's hard for us humans to understand is because we understand delayed gratification, but our dogs do not. They just simply, they don't have the cognitive ability to understand that delayed gratification. So in training, when we're training them, we must have good consequences available to them immediately. So learning by consequences is scientific known as operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is simply the type of reinforcement we're going to use for the dog to get them to repeat behaviors that we ask for and that we like. Also in oper operant conditioning there is known as punishment. So punishment is used to stop a behavior you don't like. So punishment is something that we use to stop behaviors that we don't like. For example, jumping up on us. We're gonna work on this in class. So for jumping up, if Jerry was sitting here jumping up on me, I would simply, for punishment for her, I would remove her access to reward and I would turn around and place my back to her and so that she no longer has access to me or to reward. And so that's known as a form of punishment. So punishment decreases undesirable behavior such as jumping, barking, etc. The bad form of punishment, if you will, are aversives to the dog. Uh, the worst form being um, putting a shock collar on your dog and shocking them for jumping up on you. I don't use that. I use the removal of reward actually, which is known as negative punishment, removing something that the dog wants, but he can't get because he's not doing the polite behavior that we're asking for. So in class, we are going to use operant conditioning and we're gonna use classical conditioning to help the dogs learn faster. Uh, to learn more about operant and um, classical conditioning, I urge you to Google it. For operant conditioning, you're gonna find a lot of work by um, a scientist known as B.F. Skinner. He is the father of operant conditioning and it's very, very interesting. So I recommend that you learn more about it, but I just want to give you a good overview for class. So really the takeaway about how dogs learn 
for you is that they basically learn by associations, which is emotional learning, and they learn by consequences, which is doing. Another, a tool that we are going to use in class is a marker. Our marker is simply a sound that predicts that reward is coming to the dog. It's, it acts as a bridge, if you will, or as a predictor. Previously, I mentioned that we're going to use classical conditioning, you know, that associative emotional learning to help our dogs learn, along with operant conditioning, the consequences part of learning. So a marker is going to help our dogs learn much faster and quicker. Remember I spoke about the bell ringing and Dr. Pavlov with his experiments on um, associative learning, classical conditioning. A bell rang and food fell into the chute and dogs were um, salivating at the sound of the bell. So the bell predicted that food came to the dog. So we are going to condition your dog in a similar way and we will use a sound that predicts food for them. No bells, just a verbal sound. A verbal sound that we can use will be yes, or we can use a mechanical sound, which is a clicker, this little thing, and it makes a mechanical sound. So your choice of using yes or a clicker in class is up to you in our obedience classes and our agility classes. However, in our reactive rover class, you must use a clicker. Um, so our marker is going to help our dogs understand to make the right choice and that a reward is coming. Because remember our dogs have less than one second to link reward with behavior. So just to give you a kind of a, 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 a visual to look at here, with using markers our dogs learn faster. Will they learn without using markers? Yes, but it's much slower. The learning curve without markers for a dog is kind of like this, goes up and finally we learn up here. With markers, however, the learning curve is really, it's really fast. It goes up like this. As soon as we start teaching behavior, bam, we learn it pretty fast because we have broken it down in a way that this dog brain can understand. So simply a marker is marking the moment a behavior is completed. So I'm gonna ask Jerry if she will sit up. Jerry, you sit. Yes. Now she gets reward. So I marked the moment she be completed the behavior of sit. So now I'm gonna ask her to shake. The moment she places her paw in my hand, I'm going to mark it with that verbal yes. Jerry, shake. Yes. And now she's earned reward. I'll show you that again. The timing with the marker is what I'm going to try to get you guys to have really good timing within class. Shake. Yes. So the moment the paw touches the hand. Shake. Yes. Now, what if I was using a clicker? What would that look like? That would simply look like I would be clicking the moment the paw touches my hand. Yeah. For me personally, all my dogs, I use verbal and mechanical markers. When I'm teaching new behavior, I use a clicker first. And if I want to um, have the dog um, refresh some of their behaviors that they know really well, then I use a verbal marker. I can't always have my clicker with me, but I do use it when I teach new behavior. You really want this, don't you? Yeah, good girl. So I'm going to show you at the end of this video how to make a marker relevant to your dog. We are going to use two core training concepts in most of our classes and they are known as luring and shaping. So that's how we try to teach the dog how to get the game of the training behavior that we're trying to teach them. So for example, say we want to teach Jerry how to lay down. I might teach her to do that by luring. And luring is simply taking an object of attraction like a treat to the dog's nose. And what happens when we do that is the dog nose will follow that treat to get it. So we can lure them into the position where we need them to be. For example, uh, for down. Yes. So you can use luring to teach your dog to lay down. Jerry, sit. Good girl. Down. Yes. 
and then I gave, give her the treat on the floor. So that is slurring, taking a treat to the nose and doing, getting the dog maneuvered by using their nose to follow the treat, if you will. So with luring, we gotta pay special attention to how fast we move the lure. We usually wanna move it slow and it's distance away from the dog's nose. So somewhere right in this vicinity, we will get some response out of the dog. So that's luring. The other core training concept that we are gonna use is shaping. Shaping is a little different. It is basically waiting for it to happen. So one of the skills we're going to learn in like our levels of obedience class is focusing, making eye contact with us. And for that, we are going to shape it, meaning we're going to wait for it to happen. And we're going to take small increments and build up a big behavior. Say I want to have 10 seconds of Jerry making eye contact with me. Well, in the beginning, when I go to teach her that, I'm not gonna get 10 seconds right away. So I have to start small with like one or two seconds. So in the beginning, I'm gonna shape it by marking a duration and time for like one or two seconds of watching. Yes. Good girl. So Jerry knows this behavior and it is on a verbal. Um, visually, I taught her when I point my finger up that we're going to make eye contact with me. Yes. So if you were using the clicker for this, for shaping, watch. And I fire the clicker off and then I provide reward. So that is shaping. Shaping will take you, I'm gonna help you in class, but it's basically, it's you being patient and waiting for a behavior to happen. So now I'm gonna look at Jerry and see if she will offer up a behavior to me like um, lying down or something like that. So she did. The moment she hit the floor with her chest and her belly, I marked it with the clicker. And now I'm gonna provide reward between her paws. And when we use markers, along with our core training concepts, this is how we're going to be training the dogs in class. And the dogs really understand. We are making it very clear to them what our expectations are and what it is that we want from them. And every time your dog makes eye contact with you, they are looking for one of two things. Either they want you to tell them something to do, or they're asking for permission to do something. Hey, can I go outside? Or um, I'd like to eat now. Or they're looking at you because they want to be engaged with you and do something fun with you. And that's when we ask them to do something. So, hi. so Jerry's looking at me, so I want to tell her something to do. Shake. Yes. Good girl. Good job. Those are the core training concepts that we're going to use in our levels, obedience classes, agility, and our reactive rover class. Luring and shaping. So I want to teach you how to make a marker relevant to your dog. And this is a must thing that I want you to do with your dog. It's going to take you maybe 10 minutes to do. And either pick one or the other, whether you want to use a mechanical marker, the clicker, or a verbal marker like yes. And when we use the verbal marker of yes, think of yes with an exclamation point at the end and that you want to say it very friendly. Yes, yes, yes. You also want to say it the same way every time. So in the beginning to make something relevant for the dog, like the bell was relevant to Dr. Pavlov's dogs, is we need a lot of repetitions. So basically what I recommend is when you go to feed your dog, either in the morning or in the evening, take all their food, all their kibble, and you're gonna feed them one piece of kibble at a time. And as you do that, you are going to preface it with, if you're going to use a verbal marker, you're going to say yes, and give your dog a piece of food. And repeat this, yes, food in the mouth. Yes, yes, yes. So if we do that 70 times, the word yes 
will become relevant to Jerry, she will form an association that yes equals food. It predicts food. And the same thing if you're going to use a clicker, it looks like this. You're going to, when you use a clicker, it should be neutral. It should be down at your side, maybe towards um, uh, the back of your leg. It shouldn't be something the dogs focus on. So if I'm going to use that as my relevant marker, I'll simply click and give a treat. Click piece of food. Your turn. We're dropping crumbs on the floor. And so it's simply click food. Click food or if you're doing a verbal, yes food. Yes food. One thing that should not happen is they should not go together. Do not say yes while you place the treat in your mouth. It becomes diluted and it's not a predictor of food. So your marker word or your mechanical marker clicker need to precede you giving the food. So a whole second or more before you give them the food. So that's how we make a marker relevant. And this is your must do activity before you attend class. When you come into class, I want your dog to have a marker that's relevant to them that predicts food. And believe me, our dogs are gonna learn really fast and I'll be able to promote you through our levels program at a nice steady pace. Also, what I want you to do is um, to think about what my class goals are and what your goals are for training your dog. We were to start this out, we're giving our dogs, we're starting out in kindergarten and in level one and all the way up into level five of my obedience program is a college education for our dogs. Think about what your goals are. How well trained of a dog do you want? How great of a dog partner do you want? How much of a trusting relationship do you want for your dog? How great of off-leash recall you want for your dog? The main thing I want when you come to class is I want you and your dog to have fun. I want your dog to be confident. Um, I want your dog to be attentive to you. Um, I want you to stay positive and please to have an open mind. I'm going to be helping you learn a lot of different concepts that you are not used to or you may not have heard before. Um, before you come to class, if it's in the morning class, don't feed your dog all of their breakfast. And if it's an evening class, don't feed them all of their dinner. You can bring half, you can bring part of it with you. We'll use that for a low value or a medium value treat. Um, we want you to work at your dog's level. All dogs learn differently. They learn at faster rates. So when you come to class, um, bring the items that I mentioned earlier and refer to your student handbook for the, for the dates and times of when we have our, our current schedule of levels obedience classes or agility classes. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to call me or email me. My email is saladadogs at gmail.com. And I look forward to seeing you guys in class. I really am excited to help you train your dog through choice-based reward training. And before you know it, you're gonna have a great trained dog and you're really going to have such an improved relationship and your dog is gonna be such an attentive listener to you. I'll see you in class.